So, hello and good evening everybody uh, from Europe and good morning from the USA to wherever you are in the world. I'm just taking a little bit slowly here because uh, this week especially we are um, part of the virtual global EP 3.0 summit uh, which is being run from the US and I know the previous session uh, was running very well. I just want to give a few minutes uh, for everybody to have a chance to join our meeting. So just bear with me a moment. I see the participants are, are rising well now. So we'll, we'll get going in a moment. So thanks very much for joining uh, episode four of our live webinar series, The History and Future of Electrophysiology. And uh, what the, the history and future of electrophysiology, and thanks if you are viewing the recording. Uh, my name is Stephen Brown from Acutus Medical. I will be your host for this session and our ongoing series of webinars. Each episode will be recorded and posted online. But I trust you have found time to enjoy the abstract sessions this morning. Um, and if any of the following sessions you can see listed here are of interest, uh, please go and register at acutusevents.com and uh, you'll have an opportunity to join those as we go through. So uh, please uh, take a moment to look at this um, important disclaimer slide. Okay, this week uh, we will spend 40 to 45 minutes delving further into acute Acumap's unique arrhythmia diagnosis. The comparison between non-contact and the more traditional contact map has been a source of discussion and even controversy. With the evolution of non-contact global mapping delivered through Acumap system, a scientific validation is timely. Today, we commence with a pre-recorded session prepared by Dr. Junaid Zaman that will explore the very subject. During and following the recording, Dr. Zaman is present, so you should be able to see him there, um, and to respond to your questions. To discuss further, I'm also pleased to welcome Dr. Graydon Beattie and Dr. Derek Chow, um, respectively Chief Technology Officer and Senior Director of Science and Technology at Acutus Medical. So please submit your questions via the chat button. For those of you less familiar with the Zoom meeting format, you will find the chat button at the bottom of your screen near the center. If you have a question, activate this feature and type it in. Please post to everyone rather than just the Janae, Graydon or Derek, as this will allow the entire faculty to enjoy them. So without further ado, let us commence the video. New understandings, in new understandings of space and time, a validation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation to talk to you today as part of their webinar series. My name is Dr. Janine Saman, and I am a electrophysiologist at the Royal Brompton Hospital, which is part of Imperial College London. It's my pleasure to present data regarding a new study the centre has recently published called Validation of Dipole Density Mapping During Atrial Fibrillation and sinus rhythm in human left atrium. These are my disclosures. This is the overview of the talk today. I will start by discussing an overview of this technology, which many of you will be familiar with from previous talks in this webinar series. I'll then go on to present the study design, discuss the results with specific comments regarding accuracy. I will then discuss current ongoing projects looking at validation in stable rhythms and then conclude by talking about mapping of atrial fibrillation and new data we have coming out in the near future regarding outcomes when using these approaches in ablation of atrial fibrillation. This slide summarizes the 
imaging capabilities of the Charge MC non-contact mapping system. On the left is the six spline 48 ultrasound, ultrasound transducer catheter, which has a 25 millimeter external diameter and can connect up to 115,000 ultrasound points per minute. The imaging capability is shown in the movie on the right hand panel with the catheter being rotated and the bars emanating from each individual ultrasound transducer radiating to a nearest wall whereupon it reflects in a sonar like fashion and generates an internal contour which has resolution comparable to a CT scan. The overall rotation takes approximately one to two minutes to generate and you can see at the end of the movie a smooth post-processed geometry appearing in pink. This slide recaps some of the information already presented in this education series regarding the electrophysiological mapping capabilities but it is worth revising for anyone in the audience unfamiliar with the technique. Electrical data is collected by the 48 engineered electrodes on the same catheter as the one I showed you on a previous slide without making contact with the endocardium. This is the principle of non-contact mapping. The inverse solution equation has been changed to Poisson's equation to compute unipolar electrogram based on charge density, which mitigates the far forward component of the voltage-based electrogram. Charge and voltage are intrinsically related by nature, a relationship that has been known for over 200 years. I would kindly refer you to Dr. Andrew Grace's webinar last month for more details of this, where he superbly summarized all this and his recent publication in JCI Insight, which describes this in more technical detail. By simultaneously applying non-contact voltages and ultrasound distances in an inverse solution derived manner, the dipolar sources at all locations across the chamber surface are derived. The surface dipole waveforms are sharper and narrower than the voltage waveforms with four times higher resolution activation maps. The sample acquisition speed is 150 kilohertz and it projects this on a propagation history map as you can see on the right hand image with areas of red representing activation and areas of blue representing late activation and the geometry rendered in pink as on the previous slide. The unpresented unipolar signal is shown below this as an example. So hopefully that gives an overview of the system both from an imaging capability and a electrophysical mapping capability and should allow us now to discuss the validation of these technologies in more detail. So let's move on to the paper itself recently published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Clinical Electrophysiology. The slide has the full authors and citation details. The study objectives were to validate the accuracy of unipolar reconstructed electrograms by a dipole density based non-contact mapping system against conventional contact electrograms obtained from a conventional circular catheter during both sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation in the human left atrium. The methods used to address this were as follows. 20 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation were referred to the Royal Brompton Hospital. Double transeptal puncture was performed to access the left atrium. A 20 pole circular catheter, an inquiry optima with two millimeter electrode and 15 to 25 millimeter variable loop radar was introduced via a standard long sheath and the non-contact catheter which you've seen on the previous slides which was the AccuMap was introduced via a 16 French uh, steerable transceptor sheath known as an AccuGuide. This is a central illustration from the paper. Panel A shows the catheter which you've seen on the previous slides with six blinds and 48 uh, ultrasound transducers and high fidelity unipolar electrodes. Panel B shows a fluoroscopic LAO view of the non-contact catheter and the contact catheter in the left atrium at the same time. Panel C shows the 
left atrial anatomy constructed by non-contact catheter mapping system from a PA view. Importantly, in this system, both the non-contact mapping catheter and the contact mapping catheter are visible at the same time. D shows the morphological comparison with cross-correlation of 10 non-contact reconstructed and contact electrogram pairs. The yellow dots represent 10 locations of the circular contact mapping catheter with the relevant paired contact in red and non-contact in blue electrograms. In total, 20 patients were studied, uh, comparing seven anatomical sites in left atrium and 796 pairs in sinus and 996 pairs of electrograms in atrial fibrillation. As discussed on the previous slide, the seven pre-specified regions during sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation were studied. All recorded segments of atrial fibrillation and sinus rhythm were captured for a duration of 30 seconds and reviewed offline. For atrial fibrillation recordings, 300 to 600 millisecond segments containing multiple cycles were selected for analysis, whereas single atrial deflections were selected for sinus rhythm recordings. All segments were manually chosen to complete exclusion of QRS waves and T waves. The correspondence between the non-contact reconstructed and contact electrograms was evaluated using the mean subtracted cross-correlation formula as shown below. In addition, the root mean square value of the selected segments was calculated from the electrogram pairs obtained during sinus rhythm. Amplitude was not calculated and compared for atrial fibrillation segments due to the dramatic beat-to-beat -beat variation in amplitude over time. Each mapping catheter electrode was indexed to a specific geodesic vertex on the anatomy. Cross correlation was then calculated at each surface mesh vertex residing within 5 mm from the index vertex, and the maximum correlation value found within this 5 mm radius was assigned as the morphology match value for that pair of contact and non contact electrograms. Moving on to results. This table represents the patient demographics and is available in the supplementary material of the manuscript. In total, 20 patients with a mean age of 64, 70% uh, of which were male with persistent atrial fibrillation were recruited. They had a mean AF duration of nine months and a mean left atrial power stern on long axis diameter of 43 millimeters. The left ventricular ejection fraction was 49% and the BMI and medication history are in keeping with other published series of persistent atrial fibrillation mapping studies. This is the table one from the manuscript and shows the numerical comparisons. A total of 796 sinus wave electrogram pairs were compared and the results are summarized in the second column of the table. The median morphology cross correlation was 0.85 and the time in difference in activation assignment was 6.4 milliseconds. A total of 969 atrial fibrillation electrogram pairs were, of electrograms were compared as shown on the right hand with median morphology college of 0.79 and time in difference of 14.4 milliseconds. The bottom row shows there was a difference in whether the orientation of the non-contact catheter was equatorial or polar on both timing and morphology in sinus rhythm. This difference was also present but less pronounced in atrial fibrillation where wavefront direction is more variable and would tend to equal out some of these effects across the non-contact catheter. The next slide goes on to discuss the graphical results and shows the effect of distance from the center of the non-contact catheter to endocardial comparison sites on morphology in sinus rhythm on the left and atrial fibrillation on the right. The box represents the interquartile range and a red line represents the median value. The red plus sign is the arithmetic mean and the whiskers depict the 5th and 95th percentiles. Statistics were performed between the three groups uh, below 40 mm distance and the one group above 40 mm distance using a man whitney U-test. The correlation was stronger when the radial distance from the centre of the non contact catheter to the contact catheter was less than 40 millimeters versus more than 40 millimeters. So in sinus rhythm, the mean data for the groups below 40 millimeters was 0.87 compared to 0.73 in the group above 40 millimeter distance. 
whereas in atrial fibrillation, the overall morphology correlation significantly improved again when the distance was less than 40 millimeters and was 0.81, whereas when the distance was more than 40 millimeters, it was 0.67. P is less than 0.01 for both these comparisons. Expanding out this into timing data, again, the timing difference was significantly less when the radial distance from the center of the non-contact catheter to the contact catheter was less than 40 millimeters as compared to more than 40 millimeters. In sinus rhythm on the left column, this was 5.7 milliseconds versus 15.1 milliseconds with a p-value of less than 0.01. And in atrial fibrillation in the bottom right, the time of difference was again significantly improved from 12.3 milliseconds at less than 40 millimeters radial distance to 28.3 milliseconds at more than 40 millimeters, again with a p-value of less than 0.01. This slide shows how specific anatomical positions in the left atrium compared favorably to contact electrograms in particular areas in the roof and posterior wall. The left atrial appendage had the lowest correlation as it was furthest from the non-contact catheter. The average distance was 39 millimeters, which would be in keeping with the data on the previous slide showing how this appears to be an accuracy threshold. So the discussion points from this study are as follows. This is the first study to compare dipole density-based reconstructed unipolar electrograms with contact electrograms in the human left atrium. The morphology correlation and time of difference values were significantly improved at radial distances of less than 40 millimeters with most of the comparison sites located within this range. This encompassed more than 85% of electrograms in this study. These findings are validated for both sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation electrograms. So I wanted to move on and share some data in case you weren't able to make earlier days of symposium, which extends this comparative work to stable atrial tachycardias. This slide shows a video of a technique called hover mapping or multi-position non-contact superposition or supermap generation, where the non-contact catheter is deliberately roved around an atrium in order to collect electrograms from near to the surface geometry, as can be seen by the catheter moving around inside the atrium. Once a sufficient area of uh, the a chamber has been covered, it changes from black to pink, and the pink bar at the bottom shows an overall percentage of the chamber covered. This is a principle that is combined with the conventional contact mapping methodologies in data I presented uh, previously uh, this week and is of value in mapping atrial tachycardia with a stable or variable cycle length by Gemini frequent PVCs or PACs. The data acquisition for this so-called hover mapping approximately takes two to three minutes to adequately cover the chamber in its entirety and can generate maps of any of the beats which are grouped according to their morphology and timing with respect to the coronary sinus catheter. This slide shows an example of a side-by-side -side comparison from our series, which we are currently writing up. This is from a patient with a left atrial flutter due to a roof-dependent macro entrance circuit. Let's look at the supermap propagation, which is shown on the left. This shows conduction down the posterior wall through an isthmus on the anterior wall and then around the mitral valve in a clockwise direction. Electrograms are shown from selected sites showing good correlation from the non-contact electrograms in white and the contact electrograms in red, even when the electrograms are relatively low amplitude and fractionated. Of note, this map took 1 minute 38 seconds to acquire. In this series, we have then systematically compared these data to precision maps obtained with an HD grid. I'm going to play the movie here. The same activation pattern was confirmed with a roof-dependent mechanism and then a isthmus on the anterior wall with an area near the roof RS LSPV junction where upon ablation terminated the flutter. 
we're in the process of systematically comparing these maps with blinded observers, so both clinical utility as well as the electric current features presented in an earlier study. Beyond the validation of the non-contact methods, a particular research interest of mine has been the activation patterns and their mechanistic significance in atrial fibrillation. I want to briefly discuss this along with some other data we have impressed regarding mapping of atrial fibrillation. This slide summarizes the commonly observed activation patterns of interest, or APIs. We have classified the categories of activation patterns of interest into the following groups. The first on the left is focal centrifugal activation, which is a discrete early activation within the mapping region with radial propagation to the periphery. The second in the middle panel is localized rotational activation, which is a spiraling wave activation with a rotation of more than 270 degrees centered on a confined zone located inside the mapping region. The third is shown on the right, which is composed of irregular activation patterns. And these are defined as a low class activation with isthmus-like entry and exit across a confined zone with pivoting or unsynchronized propagation in at least two directions in the adjacent zone. Looking at this more closely, we have found four distinct subcategories of LIA for localized irregular activation, which include slow conduction, which is an area of deceleration of an activation wave within a confined zone, collision, which is fusion of two or more waves of activation, pivoting, which is a partial rotation with an angular sweep of less than 270 degrees, and then accelerated conduction with acceleration of an activation wave after breaking out of a gap through a confined zone due to source sink interactions. This slide, courtesy of Atul Verma, demonstrates pattern coupling atrial fibrillation and the spatial overlap in these. We have selected on the bottom of the uh, panel eight electrograms to show the raw signal. The unipro electrograms are otherwise unprocessed. Looking at the rhythm from the propagation movie, one can see in the PA view starting on the right, the sequential activation in cycles one to eight with localized rotational activation. Then the development of a focus in electrodes three and four. Switching to the AP view, there is then a regular activation pattern shown across the anterior wall with a zone of interest circled in the dash lines which degenerates to irregular activities, which with careful attention can be seen to encompass the four categories that we proposed in the previous slide. I'll just let this play for a bit longer because the overall patterns are complex, but when systematically studied and played frame by frame, one can appreciate there do tend to be areas where there seems to be this pattern coupling or preferential conduction. Looking at this, many questions arise, which we are starting to systematically study. Firstly, do these APIs occur in specific areas of the heart? And what are the relative frequencies of them in atrial fibrillation? Finally, what is the best way to incorporate them into personalized ablation strategies? I'm going to go on to discuss each of these in turn. We recently systematically studied these patterns in 25 persistent atrial fibrillation patients. A total of 144 atrial fibrillation segments with 1,060 activation patterns were analysed. Focal centrifugal activity, or FCA, accounted for 17% of these activations and arose frequently from the pulmonary veins and ostea. However, the commonest pattern during AF was localised irregular activation, which accompanied 63% of activation patterns and consisted of the four disparate features of activation as follows. Slow conduction comprised 45%. Pivoting was 30%, collision 16%, and acceleration 7%. Localized rotation activation, or LRA, was the second most common pattern at 20%. Importantly, preferential conduction areas were typically seen in the mid anterior and lower posterior walls in approximately 40 to 50% of uh, patterns. At these sites, multiple patterns interacted, coalesced, and then fluctuated. 
Finally, I wanted to share with you outcome data from our centre at the Royal Brompton and a collaborating site in Oxford. 40 patients with de novo persistent atrial fibrillation of mean duration 9 months from two centres were prospectively studied and underwent pulmonary vein isolation following, followed by a charge density mapping guided ablation, consisting of core ablation at the sites with APIs as described previously, and then connecting the core ablation site to the nearest non-conducting boundary, the so-called core-to-block approach. This step was then repeated until the termination of atrial fibrillation or depletion of core sites in the left atrium before then moving on to targeting sites in the right atrium. The ablation outcomes following each ablation step are shown in this slide. On the left panel, AF terminated to isthmus-dependent macroentrant atrial tachycardia or sinus rhythm in 19 out of 32 patients after targeting sites in the left atrium. The commonest sites are based on the anterior wall and posterior wall, which was over 80%, and the roof in 19%. The most prevalent sites with APIs on the anterior wall consisted of a combination of LIA and LRA for LIA alone. And the most prevalent sites on the posterior wall consisted of a combination of LIA and LRA again, or a combination of all three types. Importantly, on the stepwise progression, one can see that in 5% of patients, right atrial ablation was needed to achieve termination. On the right, the graph shows how the average number of API sites increased with the duration of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this went from an average one site in patients presented in sinus rhythm with persistent atrial fibrillation to uh, over three sites in those presented with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. This is in keeping with data from many other AF driver mapping techniques showing an increased number of AF sources with increased AF duration. This slide shows how pulmonary vein isolation affected API distribution. PVI in 40 patients encompassed a total of 56 API sites in the vicinity of the PV antra. That's approximately 1.4 sites per patient. Of these 56 sites, despite coexistence of a different API, the dominant pattern near the PVs was focal centrifugal activity, as would be expected from the seminal data of Michel Hassegger's group in 1998. In 8 out of 40 patients, PVI terminated atrial fibrillation to either sinus rhythm in 5 patients or an isthmus dependent macroentrant atrial tachycardia in three patients. In the remaining 32 patients, 3.6 APIs per patient were observed after remap following pulmonary vein isolation. On the right is an example of how the PVR lesion set subtly changed the location and type of the activation pattern of interest, such that post-PVI, the area near the L LPV becomes more irregular than the rotational pattern seen in the top panel. In the study group, the number of LA target sites identified by charge entity mapping pre and post PVI were 3.7 and 3.6 respectively. API ablation took a similar length of time, 31 minutes, to PVI, which took 33 minutes. We anticipate these times will improve with familiarity and repetition of the workflow. At 24 months follow up, freedom from atrial rhythm is from a single procedure was 80% across the two centres. The average time from the procedure to first recurrence was eight months, and four out of six patients with atrial tachycardia had a second procedure. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the recent study by Xi et al. validates non-contact electrograms with respect to morphology and timing within a 40 millimeter radius. 85% of all electrograms and clinical data from persistent AF patients with diameters of 43 millimeters fell within this accuracy threshold. We are extending this validation of contact versus non-contact maps in stable repetitive rhythms with initial data showing a higher spatial temporal accuracy achieved in significantly less time. And in separate work, we have shown the commonest activation pattern of interest is irregular activity with the four subdivisions which overlap at preferential areas. And finally, early encouraging outcome data using a systematic approach to ablation in two centers are in keeping with a non-randomized prior published series. I'd like to thank you for, and again, thank the organizer for the invitation to speak. And I would look forward to taking your questions or can be contacted via any of the email or Twitter addresses below. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Graydon and Derek, I sincerely hope you were taking notes because that was an amazing amount of information that uh, Dr. Zaman has shared with us. Sinead, thank you very much. That was really fascinating. I'll invite Graydon and Derek uh, to discuss with you and please uh, our broader audience if you have any questions please ask via the chat and we can uh, get involved with picking up on some of those. Um, I see uh, Dr. Tomlinson has put a question in um, and um, I'll leave 
the uh, three of you to discuss this. Uh, we've got around 10 minutes or so, maybe a little longer um, before we have to move on. So thank you so much, uh, Junaid, fantastic, thank you. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for that. Um, so I guess we can start off with the question directly from Dr. Tomlinson about cycle length slowing preceding termination. So we have uh, actually found that this does precede termination, but have chosen not to use that as a marker of effect of acute ablation. So whereas previous studies have chosen to use a 10% change in cycle length at a, as an effective endpoint, um, partly because we are starting off with a different mechanistic hypothesis that ablation at these sites should actually terminate the rhythm, our endpoint is slightly different. So we've chosen to, to be stricter in the sense of it has to terminate to either sinus rhythm or tachycardia. However, analyzing the data, there is, or in almost all cases, a slight prolongation in the immediate few beats prior to termination, as one would expect. Um, there are some cases when atrial fibrillation terminates where it is abrupt, like a stochastic phenomenon where essentially a and a, a wavelet generated source has, a, a has been uh, treated and the wavelets around the area have stochastically terminated in a finite fashion. But we do not choose to use cycle length prolongation in our studies as an endpoint. Uh, Derek, Graydon, do you, do you want to comment on that um, before I take the next question? No, you've articulated that perfectly. Okay, so, uh, okay, thanks. So we have a question from uh, Kamal Kotak. So have we done any redo redo so redo cases or redo redo cubes cases and what are the insights uh, short answer is yes uh, we have been involved in some uh, the data presented obviously are all first time de novo ablations uh, the redo redo cases are uh, usually um, done with uh, in our center the world brompton a dual mapping system uh, in order to ensure that things like the pulmonary veins are uh, adequately treated and mapped with a high density catheter, we are slightly changing our workflow in cases where there is a redo of an atrial tachycardia, as actually is the commonest mechanism of recurrence of almost all atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, that's in direct relation to the data I presented earlier in the week where we're finding that this new um, hover mapping technique or uh, super mapping technique can essentially map stable ATs uh, with the same fidelity of a contact catheter. So, in redo redos, I think the question is, number one, are your veins 100% isolated, which you can actually check now with pacing with Supermap. But secondly, um, can you map the rhythm and the AT? And if you have atrial fibrillation that it generates, uh, we have a, a number of those cases and the sources tend to be, again, to, recur, to repeat the data I presented in spatially preferred areas. There does seem to be a, a, a preferential conduction areas in these chambers that have um, importance. It's gonna go back to the chat. Anything else to expand on that from a uh, great no perspective specifically? Yeah, I would just like to add that in the uncover data, um, the subset of patients that were restudied. So that was de novo. And then there was a, the possibility of a redo after the, it had to happen after the three month blanking period, not during. So we were strict about that. When we compared the maps that we saw in the redo compared to the, uh, the initial case, we definitely could see correlation between those maps. And the primary thing that we could learn was uh, in the majority of the redos, first of all, they were not recurrences of AF. The majority were flutteroid. And we could see that there was clearly an issue in the lesion durability from the previous lesion set. So we could recognize conduction in some gap that had opened up. And in closing those gaps, uh, the, the subsequent outcome increased significantly. And that data is reported in the, uh, in the Uncover study. OK, thanks for that. I'm uh, just going to go on to the uh, other questions in the chat room. So we have. Um, a question from Sean Thomas. So do you have a specific workflow for anatomy collection or supermap? Uh, yes, we've developed a, uh, a research protocol where, which we're actually developing into an actual uh, practical pro, uh, workflow where we're spending a couple of minutes in the chamber uh, roving the catheter before any ablation or other mapping is performed to generate a initial arrhythmia map. We then, uh, in the research study, are using the 
precision uh, high density catheter to then contact to collect contact data uh, and then we're choosing to then compare the two maps uh, live as during the case but uh, then actually in the research study we're using the conventional system to target with our ablation this will be obviously drastically rationalized as we stop the research study uh, once it's published and go on to a single mapping system only but we are finding the workflow is quite smooth in terms of data collection and processing speed um, at the moment does that answer the question or is there anything else that um, Graydon or Derek you'd like to expand on from having seen this in various centers beyond the Royal Brompton? Okay, Sean has said that answers it, so that's fine. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Uh, so can, so this is from Dr. Thompson again, uh, or David Thompson, can charge density tell you anything about endo to epi conduction direction? So this is a, uh, interesting area which uh, I think the short answer is it's difficult to be certain without having done systematic studies with simultaneous epicardial recordings. There is a lot of um, data uh, from groups that have studied transmural conduction in exquisite detail. Uh, this is main, the most uh, obvious group that springs to mind is Vadim Fedorov's group in Ohio State who have performed transmural optical infrared imaging to show a micro reentrant source on the endocardium can look like a focal breakthrough on the epicardium. We don't have that data yet with almost any technology uh, because we have spent years mapping the inside of the heart exclusively or as with other kind of approaches using the body surface, the outside of the heart. There are some clues you would expect which are preserved between voltage and dipole, such as the QS morphology showing a breakout in another direction. Uh, but there are uh, limited data to actually specifically answer whether we can trace endo to epi conduction. Um, again, Derek, great, uh, great, and I'd be happy for you to chime in with any yeah, um, dipole clues I mean, that you can come up with. From, from my perspective, I think uh, it's a fantastic question. I think it's something that we need to, we need to answer. Um, I think the first step is to do, as you said, um, Dr. Zaman to, to make some observations of what, you know, what, what we are mapping from, uh, from an end, the epicardial space looks like uh, epicardially and to make those observational assessments. Uh, at the same time, from a development perspective, um, there's a couple of pieces there. One is in order to, in order to, to, to attempt to look at um, non-contact mapping uh, through that space, we would need to uh, generate uh, that that transmural space in the in, in in the anatomy creation, and so that is a part of our product roadmap uh, to try and use our ultrasound and look at uh, transmural thickness, and um, and then we'll be able to potentially um, examine what it would look like to actually map the electrical conduction through through that through that region. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, so and I'd on. just like to quickly add to we we do know we do see preservation of small R waves and QSs, depending on, on depth, even projected onto the endocardial anatomy that we're currently using. Um, and uh, Derek has described very well the ongoing work to add volumetric information. Great, thank you very much for the question. That's, uh, as I say, it's a really fascinating area of ongoing work right now. Um, so we have a question uh, from uh, take this order, sorry, from Courtney Wilson saying, uh, how have you utilized Supermap in your practice? Uh, have you been able to map multiple arrhythmias with one recording? So uh, it's a great question. We've actually used Supermap uh, quite a bit, uh, as I said, as part of a systematic research series that we're currently in the kind of uh, final stage of writing up. The, um, the principal motivation uh, was the termination cases that we've had success with in atrial fibrillation when uh, you're left still challenged with a stable reentrant rhythm uh, and at the end of a long AF ablation case in a non in a non paroxysmal patient what to do about the rhythm so in in those cases we've found that the additional um, algorithm and hover mapping has helped patients have a uh, more focused remainder of the case rather than for example having to rely on a contact mapping system as an additional um, uh, expense or as additional time burden in terms of the uh, multiple arrhythmias questions, we've been validating the uh, technology in paste rhythms. So one of the objects we discussed uh, earlier this week, except for the HOS, was use of CS distal and CS proximal pacing to validate the rhythms 
uh, effect on unipolar morphology. It can deal with uh, PACs by geminal beats or abrupt terminations quite accurately. Um, what is uh, under investigation still is the uh, kind of threshold and the uh, impact of how much the user-defined beat grouping can be used to look at cycle length wobbling or instability in a stable tachycardia. But certainly we found in the validation with pacing directions uh, and in the occurrence of ectopic beats, it actually handles that very well with minimal kind of time spent having to re-acquire uh, any data. I hope that addressed that sufficiently. Uh, let me just check. Can you, so Oli Kongstad has asked, can you collapse your vein order to map inside the veins? That's a very good question, Oli. Um, I don't think we have, so no, I have not done that. Um, 25 millimeters means you probably should be able to fit it inside a vein and use it as a contact catheter. But um, personally, I'm not sure we are looking at that as an avenue of uh, exploration because we actually, as I presented, have been doing this with a contact catheter, i.e. a spiral um, optima for these cases. Um, Derek, Graydon, could we yeah, use contact um, catheters? The, the short question, the yeah, the short question, uh, the, sure, sorry, the short answer with the current generation of the Acumap catheter is no. You could probably fit it into the left upper, but the proximal shaft is stiff enough that the other structures would be much more challenging to get into and, and adjust. Uh, by the way, this is a new meme. Um, you have to grow a sixth finger, but um, uh, you can size it once you're in that structure. So in the second generation of the Acumap catheter, um, we have to validate and prove this out, but um, the proximal shaft is uh, significantly more flexible and the guiding sheath for the device in the second generation guiding sheath is a bit more robust. And we're very interested in seeing how far we can go with um, actually bringing the device into the venous structure and having a three-dimensional, uh, imagine that as a three-dimensional lasso rather than a two-dimensional structure to look at pulmonary vein potentials. So that's in the works coming soon. Okay, great. Uh, let me just go back to the chat room. So we have a Tim Higuero has asked, how much time does having two mapping systems add to your workflow? Uh, it does add a, uh, a reasonable amount of time, mainly from the fact we have a very uh, strict research protocol we're adhering to for the data acquisition. The majority of the time, as you probably have concluded from the time on the slide I had in the presentation, comes from the contact mapping data collection. The, um, we tend to find that the hover mapping takes about two to three minutes and whilst we're uh, exchanging catheters, exchanging um, uh, sheaths and introducing contact catheters, our colleagues are post-processing the data on the terminal the contact maps can take anything for 15 to 20 minutes on average to acquire. Um, but clearly, as I stated before, we're not planning to do this for that much longer. It's more of a validation tool in a subset of 25 patients with atrial tachycardias. But um, it does certainly add uh, time to perform uh, clinical research. And that's the justification for using two sets of catheters. So I'm just going to go on to Diego's question. Diego Nunes, is it possible to confirm PVR using only the Acumap catheter, i.e. without the use of a circular PV catheter? Uh, yes, absolutely. So this is actually one of the, um, we didn't present it, but it's one of the uh, methods we're now using in the pacing protocol validation of the supermap or the kind of the technology you saw where we are mapping stable uh, rhythms. And one of those stable rhythms you can use is essentially P8 pacing and checking for conduction within a pulmonary vein. So we've got numerous examples where we've been able to get the uh, location of a PS or a PV uh, side of conduction from the non-conduct data. We have then, as I have said multiple times, validated it again with a circular mapping catheter to verify and then perform ablation guided by that. But we have found actually you can, um, there's significant overlap between the two. Okay. Gentlemen, uh, 
forgive me for interrupting it. It's a really fascinating discussion. I'm afraid we're coming to the end of our time. So if you have any uh, points you'd just like to summarise in the next few minutes, uh, be very grateful and then we'll, we'll look to conclude the session. Okay, sure. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm going to use... Uh, so I think I'm just using presenter's privilege to say I think I've dealt with Kamal contact questions. So for contact mapping, yes, we pull the basket back into the sheath, remove the abrasion, exchange for mapping catheter. So it is a bit of sheath exchange and in and out that you would probably want to minimize. Uh, but for the purpose of research study with an ACT above 350, it's been not an issue so far. Uh, I think I have nothing else to say in terms of comments to wrap up, but I think the questions have been great and uh, it's been a uh, really lively session. So thank you very much for your attention in, in hearing some of our early data. Well, thanks very much to our presenters, to Dr. Junaid Saman, Graydon and Derek. Uh, we'll follow up on any unanswered questions. And um, Should you wish to revisit the webinar, it will be shortly available online, where you can already find episodes one, two, and three uh, via our registration page. Okay, so um, please make yourself available for episode five next week at the same time, uh, Acumap, the future of electrophysiology in practice. Here I'll be delighted to introduce Dr. Tamash Sisley-Torok from the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. He will be exploring um, how global chamber mapping has impacted on his treatment strategies and he shares clinical examples of unique outcomes. Goodbye and thank you very much for joining us.